It's been a memorable year for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in East Idaho. A temple was announced in Pocatello. The Idaho Falls Temple reopened after being closed over two years. And at BYU-Idaho, a new president was named. Recently, Elder David A. Bednar, a former BYU-Idaho president and a current member of the church's Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, agreed to sit down with me along with his wife. We talked about a variety of issues facing church members in East Idaho and around the world. Elder and Sister Bednar, thank you for speaking with us. We know that the Idaho Falls Temple is opening uh, beginning of June. It's being rededicated. Pocatello was just announced. What does this say about the growth of the church in East Idaho? Well, I don't know about the demographic growth or the population growth, but I think it says more about the people than anything, about their spirituality, about their desires to have a temple, and the fact that they will attend. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. The reason the saints gather in this entire dispensation is to be able to be of sufficient, sufficient strength that a temple can be built. So it's just an indication of ever-increasing spiritual maturity, strength, and gratitude. Why should non-members care? What does it do for people that aren't members of the church? Our temples are different than our houses of worship because in the temples we participate in the holiest ordinances and sacraments of our, of our church. They're places of light and truth and goodness. And that goodness has an impact not only in the temple for the members of the church, but in the entire community as well. Uh, the temples are always beautifully lighted at night. And that light is a reflection of the goodness that emanates from the temple and blesses everyone in the community, not just the members of our church. And of course, everyone's invited to go through the, the open house, which sure. is happening in Idaho Falls right now. And people are welcome to come to the grounds of the temple. Uh, a person does need to be a member in good standing in the church to be in the temple after it's dedicated. But the grounds are maintained beautifully and all are welcome to come and ponder and be reverent and enjoy the spirit of the temple grounds. It's an exciting time with the temples in East Idaho and some changes up at BYU-Idaho. Of course, President Gilbert is leading a whole new education initiative for the church. And Henry J. Eyring has just been called as the new president. Of course, you all lived in Rexburg and were there when the university transitioned. Uh, what are your thoughts now when you look at what's happened compared to when you arrived back in 1997? I'm just glad they've upgraded the caliber of the presidents. They've just got <laughs> consistently better since about 2004. Sister Bednar? Well, when we first went there, it was Rick's College. And the changes that have come over the past 20 years have been remarkable. In fact, it'll be 20 years of summer since we went. So to watch that change from Rick's College to BYU-Idaho was faith-promoting to me. We went back a little over a year ago to see the things that were put in place when my husband was there. They're still there, only they've been added upon in a remarkable way. So it's just fun to go back to visit the campus. The spirit of Rick's is still there, which is wonderful and, and rewarding and, and heartwarming to us because the intent when it was move from Ricks College to BYU-Idaho is to keep a special spirit on that campus. I think you can still feel that spirit in the students and, and the faculty. Now when you obviously went to Ricks, it, you didn't know it was going to be turning into BYU-Idaho. No. And you've talked publicly a little bit about uh, announcing that the university was transitioning. What were your thoughts the night before or the week leading up to that announcement? Did you realize that this was history changing? Well, I learned a great lesson. I, uh, there was a, a necessary renovation to the Spory building, which was the oldest building on the campus. We did a number of engineering studies to identify the fact that it could not be renovated, could not simply be restored, it had to be replaced. And I remember making the mistake coming home and telling Susan after we had explained to the campus community, to everybody in Rexburg, why the Spory building had to be demolished and the design that we had come up with to try to make it reminiscent of the old Spory building as we built the new one. I said, I think I've done the hardest thing I'll ever have to do as the president of Ricks College. I remember that night. Really? The, that was before the announcement that it would become BYU-Idaho. 
I, I have to acknowledge that uh, as I look back, and it's been almost 20 years, I can't believe that much time has flown by. And to me, it is an absolute evidence of the Lord's hand uh, in His work. Uh, I can remember as we were trying to find a location as a part of the transition for the Gordon B. Hinckley building. And if you go back to the late 1990s, right after the turn of the century, the most logical place to put that building would have been next to the Hart building where the old baseball field, softball field was. And we never felt settled about that, and it made no sense. So the Hinckley building that was then built up farther on the hill in the direction of where the temple now is. That's the only place you could have built the auditorium. Now I could go for hours and hours, which you don't have time for, about decisions that we tried to make to the best of our ability, but clearly uh, the Lord had a game plan for what was taking place. So as we go back now, 20 years later, see the size of the student body, the very campus, the physical structure of the campus, the way it's laid out, uh, it was not laid out by an architect, it was laid out by him in a most remarkable way, and I see ample evidence of that every time I go back. We first met 15 years ago. I was in a class that you taught as the president. One of the things you frequently taught and still do in your current role is acting rather than being acted upon. Can you share maybe an example in your lives where you've put this principle into work and how it has changed you? Sure. Uh, I'd like to think I put that principle into work every day because faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is a principle of action and of power. So he expects us to act in accordance with his teachings. Then we're blessed by the power of his spirit. So as I study the scriptures, I think sometimes we study the scriptures as objects. We read dutifully because we know we're supposed to. There's my five pages for the day. And then we kind of wait for heaven to drop a package on our front porch. Like, here's what I'm supposed to get out of this. If we are agents acting and we go into the scriptures with a question, a concern, a puzzlement, then if we are asking, seeking, and knocking, uh, answers are more readily recognized when we're acting as an agent. I think the same thing is true about prayer. I'd like to hope that I'm getting better at praying as an agent instead of an object. Instead of, please make this happen, please bless me, to help make happen what thou wouldst have happen. So I don't think it's an abstract thing. I don't think it's like in major life events only. I think that principle should be a part of what we're doing spiritually and temporally every day. Sister Bednar. Well, I've learned something at BYU-Idaho and I've tried to follow what I heard back then for many years. And that is something that Elder Iring said when he came, then Elder Iring, now President Iring. It was interesting because he's told the students that if they would pray every day to see where the hand of the Lord had intervened in their life that day, that it would be made known to them. And you have to do that. You have to act and pray about that or you miss the Lord's hand in your life. And it's been amazing to me how many times I've seen the hand of the Lord act and intervene in my life every single day. If I have the faith and the courage and the discipline to do that every day. So that's one thing that I've done that's act that truly has changed my life. It's really blessed my life and, and helped me Absolutely. in remarkable ways. Let's go back to October of 2004. You're living in Rexburg. What happened? A phone call changed your life. Yeah, again. It was a Thursday afternoon, uh, probably, I think, between 2 and 3 o'clock. And uh, Betty Oldham, who served as my assistant, uh, said, there's a phone call for you, and it's President Hinckley. And when you're the president of one of the church universities, that's not unusual. So I went into my office and I said, hello, President. And he said, David, are you coming to general conference? Which was to begin on Saturday. I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, good, I need to visit with you. 
stop by and see me when you get here. And I said, President, please tell me the time that would be most convenient for you. He said, be here tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I said, okay, yes, sir. I went home that night, and I explained to Susan. I said, President Hinckley called today, and he wants to see me tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and I know exactly what he wants. We've been here almost eight years. He's going to say, David, thank you very much. Go get a job. Hmm. Anticipating that there would be a new president. This was October. They'd probably make the change in the late spring. That would give us time to go figure out what we were going to do. So the next day, I uh, taught my teachings of the Living Prophets class. We left uh, Rexburg at about 11 o'clock, got to Salt Lake at 2.30. Susan waited for me in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, and I met President Hinckley at 3 o'clock. And we visited for an hour, and uh, he extended the call to serve. And you didn't have any idea beforehand? No. And I had less of an idea when I walked out of his office. <laughs> so you walk out of his office and go find your wife? Uh, this is a really pretty interesting series of events. I came to the Joseph Smith Memorial Building and pulled Susan close and whispered into her ear what had happened. And uh, we just spent a couple of moments trying to really understand what had happened, and we had no clue. And then we went and had dinner, and I said, this is the last time we're ever going to be able to do this this way. And President Hinckley had told me at the conclusion of our time together, he said, now David, tell me how you feel. And I said, President Hinckley, I am stunned. And he said, good, you should be. And then he said, now you'll speak in the Sunday morning session of General Conference. You'll speak for 10 minutes, not 9, not 11. You need to speak for 10 minutes. And you have to turn your talk in tomorrow at 8 o'clock because it has to be translated into 107 languages. Oh, my goodness. So we had dinner. And then we went back to the hotel. And uh, Susan was very supportive while I tried to write a general conference talk. First time speaking in general conference? Yes. And what are you thinking, Sister Bednar? Well, he said the first words out of my mouth when he told me were, I don't think I can do this. I really did feel that way. And I'm sorry I felt that way because the Lord's blessed me throughout my life to be able to do hard things and things that I didn't think I could do. So. It was mostly a lack of faith, I think, in myself. Plus, when you start to think about the longevity of this calling, it's a long time. And I wasn't sure what to do. I thought, how, how do I know how to be an apostle's wife? I don't know what to do, and I'm still trying to figure it out. But it's been a remarkable experience, and the unfolding of events that weekend were the genesis of his talk that he gave the following conference about tender mercies. That's become kind of a catchphrase really in the church since that time. So it was a remarkable experience, but daunting, a bit scary, a bit, I don't know, overwhelming. Did you then call your sons? Or did you have no. to wait? You, you go ahead and tell this. <laughs> President Hinckley said you can't tell anyone. Oh, wow. And Except I, my wife. And I said, surely we can tell our sons. One lived in North Carolina at the time, another one in Austin, Texas. Uh, our youngest son was a student at BYU, and I said, surely we can tell our sons. And he said, no. Then I waited a few more minutes, and I said, <laughs> our, our sons won't tell anyone. This is, this is the most important day of your whole life. Surely we can tell them. And he said no again. And I waited now, a I just while. Went, hold on. I was just trying to be true to what President Hinckley had told me to do. I know, but, yeah. but I waited a while. And I asked him one more time. And he looked at me. And he said, Martin. And you know how Joseph Smith begged to show the Lord to show the, the, trans, the manuscript to Martin Harris. And it was lost. And he just said the word Martin. And I caught on really fast, <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to push this any farther. And the remarkable thing was that our son came to conference with us the next morning, the yeah, one that was at BYU. After fasting and prayer, we have called Elder Dieter Frederick Ugdorf 
and De Elder David Allen Bednar to fill these vacancies in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. They will speak to us Sunday morning, and you'll get to know them better. I don't want to make this overly dramatic, but that was announced after 10 o'clock Mountain Time. On the East Coast, where our oldest son was, that means it's noon. They had to get from Raleigh, North Carolina. He was a student at the University of North Carolina. They had to get from Raleigh, North Carolina to Salt Lake. Now, with no advance planning, no airline reservation, no nothing, I mean, what's the likelihood that you are in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at noon, hear that announcement, and they were in our hotel room that night at 10 o'clock? Wow. Uh, that was amazing. Same thing happened with our other son and his wife in Austin, Texas. I think there was help to get them there so that they could be a part of that weekend. Have you been able to go to dinner again and not have gawkers or people wanting to speak with you? How has life changed? When your face is in every high council room and seminary and institute class in every church building all over the world, uh, the anonymity is gone. But the truth of the matter is, it's very enjoyable. Uh, we belong to the church. And so to have the opportunity to meet a family, and if, especially if they have children, uh, to have a few minutes or some period of time with this family and to make it a really cool experience for them, something that's memorable, is really enjoyable. So that's just a part of what this is, and we enjoy it. But we have dinner at home most of the time. <laughs> there you go. Because yeah. it's hard to eat the meal. Yeah. And I tell everyone <laughs> that when he was a bishop, I learned how to share him with a, the ward. And when he was the stake president, I learned how to share him with the stake. And when he was in Area 70, I learned how to share him with the area. And now I'm trying to learn how to share him with the whole world. So it's been a, a great experience. The people we meet are extraordinary people, wonderful people and we love the members all over the world. So it's not a hardship, but like he said, we have dinner at home most evenings. Yeah, I just need to say one thing about Susan. There's a lot of notoriety, a lot of uh, visibility when one is called to the position that I'm presently in. But one of the things I absolutely know is that uh, that's only possible because of Susan. Um, she makes the much more Christ-like offering. She doesn't get public acclaim, but uh, the Lord, for whatever he saw in me, could only see it because of her. Thanks. Now, tell us uh, what you've learned from your fellow brethren over the past 15 years? 13, 13 years. Yeah. Well, these are remarkable men that have great faith. And I don't know all of them well because I don't work with them every day like my husband does, but I have seen what the Lord's done to and for my husband. And I know that the men that he works with are called of God. And they're called for a reason. In the Lord's day and time, they're the man and the men that he's called and, and that fit best with what he's trying to do with his kingdom here on earth right now. So it's been extraordinary to associate with them and, and to watch them. Uh, I would summarize it this way. As, as good as these men are in public and their lives are an open book, as good as they are in public, they're even better in private. I get to see them when they have heartache in a family or when they have physical pain with something that they're suffering with. Uh, and they're better in private than they are in public. There's not a face that's a public face. It's the same face, public or private. And when I watch them in the, the things that they experience, they're better in private than they are in public. Sometimes you can read in the Book of Mormon and wonder what would it have been like to know Captain Moroni I serve with 14 of them, and uh, they are that good and that courageous. They're men, they have preferences, they have idiosyncrasies, we all do. 
but uh, I know who Captain Moroni is because I'm, I'm working with 14 of them. What's the number one thing that you've learned as an apostle? Uh, it's not something that's a new learning as an apostle, but I have uh, frequent experience with the fact that the Lord knows us by name. Uh, people look at the role of a member of the Quorum of the Twelve and they see us speak in general conference in, for, in front of large congregations and temple dedications, all of which we do and those are eternally essential. But what I've, I've learned is that we'll travel halfway around the world for what would appear to be participating in assemblies like that. But we always find one person or a series of individuals that the Lord sent us uh, to bless. I don't mean only by the laying on of hands, but to in some way touch and bless their lives. We go as his representatives all over the world to touch a one. And so whenever we say he knows us by name, the first word uttered by the Eternal Father in this dispensation was Joseph. He called Joseph by name. So this is not a rhetorical flourish. This is an attempt to be dramatic. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Redeemer, knows us by name. Could you share maybe a, a time where this teaching, what you've learned, you, you've put into action? Maybe an example? Sure. You helped me with this one. We were just in a part of the world um, and we had a very hectic schedule and we were uh, traveling to an MTC where in a large auditorium area we were going to do a nationwide broadcast. Uh, our plane arrived a little bit early and so the people who were helping us with the transportation said, we've got uh, probably 15 or 20 minutes that we didn't count on, so if you want to go say hi to the missionaries in the MTC, we can do that. We said, of course, let's go do it. And so in the, the 10 minutes that I had, I gave an overview to these missionaries of what I just talked about in general conference. The distinction between being called to the work and assigned to a specific field of labor. And I bore my testimony and we were walking out and I grabbed Susan's hand and I said, why in the world did I talk about that? And I if, was wondering why too. <laughs> if I've only got 10 minutes, why did I talk about that in this setting? I said, that's kind of perplexing. So we walked out and the MTC president came up to me and he said, who told you about the sister on the front row? And I said, nobody told me anything about a sister on the front row. He said, well, there's a sister on the front row and she had her assignment changed three days ago and she's been quite distressed. And he said, Elder Bednar, I think uh, the message you just delivered was just for her. And I asked him to take me back in so I could meet the young woman. And when I saw her, I said, now, did some of that help you, understanding about the reassignment? She had tears in her eyes. And I said to my wife, and I said to the MTC president, I'm going to do something that I probably shouldn't do, but I gave her a hug. I said, with all these people around, it's okay. I said, now, sister, I want you to know, I'm here for a lot of reasons. And maybe the major one is that the Lord sent me to deliver that message, which I had not planned to do, so that you would know he knows you by name. What would you add to that? When we travel internationally, which is when I usually travel with him, at the end of our assignment, I ask him to write down the top 10 things on his list that happened. And every single time, there's an experience just like the one he said, where someone's been touched and helped because the Lord knows that they need a stroke, a caress from heaven, that he knows who they are. And they know because of it works through him. A lot of teenagers are, are scared about the world, what's happening and what the future will hold. What would, what would your counsel be to, to those watching? It's a complex world out there, really complex. And I just would hope that they would know and remember that the decisions that they make as youth determine their destiny. President Monson's taught that for a long time. 
So don't do anything in your youth that would make you have regrets later on. And then there's so much bullying and social media stuff going on where you can really intimidate and even ruin someone's reputation. I would hope that youth would remember who they are and be kind and reach out to everyone. And also remember, you said you teach youth at church. At church, everyone deserves to be loved, to feel loved, and to have a friend. I'll tell young people the same thing that President Hinckley told a group of BYU-Idaho students one time. He said, have faith. Faith in the Lord, faith in yourself, and faith in the future. I think that's great advice for teenagers. Mine's really very simple. Uh, for young men and young women, be good boys and good girls. Then you qualify for the companionship of the Holy Ghost as you honor your ordinances and your covenants. It all works out. I can remember as a younger man hearing President Hinckley give an answer like that and thinking, it can't be that simple. Now I'm becoming an old man. And the answer is, yeah, it is that simple. We can then wax strong, wax, our confidence can wax strong in the presence of God. So if we just do the simple things, that we know we should do as disciples of the Savior and try to do them consistently. He makes more of us than we can ever make of ourselves. In ways I do not understand, we are in the places we are supposed to be at the right time so that things can unfold in our life that are blessings and that bless those whom we love the most. So be good, press forward, uh, and have that faith that Susan just described, and all things will work together for our good. Last question. <clears throat> In 30, 40 years, when those teenagers are adults and you're, you're gone, you're not here anymore, what do you want them to remember about you? How do you want to be remembered? I think I would love to be remembered as a person who had charity and love. That. I truly gave my heart and soul to the people that I meet and come in contact with and that I, that I gave my, my heart to the Lord. Um, I won't be remembered. I don't really want to be remembered, except that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren would know that we really tried to be, worked to be, yearned to be followers of the Master. I do have one more thing, and that is uh, we spent eight of the richest years of our life in eastern Idaho. There might be a person or two who will watch this segment, and I just want to express gratitude and thanks to all of the people that uh, we learned from and who influenced us in very positive ways as we lived there. Uh, it was a tumultuous time with the transition of Ricks College to BYU-Idaho. We learned lessons for a lifetime. And there's a part of Rexburg in eastern Idaho that goes with us everywhere in the world. Those lessons that we learned there uh, are enduring. Um, uh, we've been to more than a hundred countries in the last 13 years. And I think we've left a little bit of Eastern Idaho in each one of those places that we've been to. So I love, people say, well, do you miss living in Idaho? I do not miss the wind. <laughs> I do not miss the cold. But we miss the people and we love them. And I, I think I would be missing a real opportunity if I didn't say thanks for all the things they've done for us. Any uh, restaurants or places that you used to go? I know you hiked the Tetons. Any, any particular things you, you remember or that you missed? Yeah, I'll start on this one. Uh, I used to go run the, the stadium stairs every morning, and the students knew about this. And so I would have some number of students there almost every morning who wanted to run with me. And uh, I had some phenomenal uh, talks with students at 5 o'clock in the morning, even in the winter time in the football stadium, going up and down the stairs and just enjoying that time with the students. That's great. 
And I remember speaking at a seven state fireside. In the message I gave, I just expressed my love to the students and said, I wish I could take all of you home with me and feed you <laughs> ice cream and cookies. And I don't remember if it was the day after on Monday evening or the week following. I think it was because that was a Sunday night and they, they came the next Monday. And anyway, they came, if our memory's correct, the next night and they said, we're here for ice cream and cookies. They to your house? They yeah. brought. They brought they the brought ice cream and the cookies. Stuff they said we're here. and some treats. And that was the genesis for the home evenings that we had with the students on campus. And it just grew and grew and grew. So every Monday night, we had the opportunity to associate with the remarkable students that were there in a fabulous way. And I'll always remember the feelings that I felt every Monday night when we were with the students. And then also, I attended Elder Bednar's class that he taught every week. So, Nate, I saw the back of your head. I always <laughs> right. sat in the back. And you brought donuts one Friday. Funny that I remember that. <laughs> Well, his class was hard. I just, I think you deserved a treat. So, but hopefully the things that you learned and that the other students learned there will profit them for a lifetime. And I, I think that the preparation for me that I had at BYU-Idaho has blessed me tremendously in my role of trying to support him and his calling now. Thank you both so much. Well, thank you for inviting us to do this. I, I appreciate it. We brought a piece of Rexburg with us, Florence's chocolates. Oh, I never used to like chocolates until we moved to BYU-Idaho. <laughs> I discovered we I've will. been missing out for a long, long time. Yeah. We will gladly accept it. All right, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Nate.